Hello YouTube, this is Sam Gerrans from Quarternight.com. Today is Friday 20th of April 2018. And today I want to look at the, uh, the, the thorny issue of how to live in this crazy world. And um, I get messages on this, uh, on this on this line quite often and it's um you know it's not easy is it you uh you know when you know what you know um i mean there is, there's a whole barrage of of things which happen firstly i mean when you just sort of to use the, the the latest nomenclature when you wake up when you realize that um <clears throat> the, the cattle truck isn't going to uh to club med um holiday camp it's uh, it's going somewhere else uh, you have to get through all of that there's then there's the there's the exclusion from the broader society there's the loneliness there's the existential angst um and all the rest of it and then when you add to that um you know being uh, putting oneself in a position where you're going to think independently on on the question of religion, which uh, for some reason, for some reason, those who hold to um, the uh, the mainstream religions uh, seem to think that um, it's almost blasphemous using your own mind. Uh, and when they refuse to use theirs, you're supposed to put your eternal soul on the um, to, to rest that on the on the very <clears throat> doubtful foundation of uh, of, of their um, tender mercies. So there's a whole load of different factors of things which are going on. Added to that, you know, when one has children and then trying to exist in this world, and then you've got to make a living, and you know, you you can't you can't eat air and all of that. It's it, I think it sends a lot of people over the edge, and that's what I'm going to try to unpick from the point of view of personal experience this is i'm not claiming any um hard and fast general rules for anyone i'm just going to kind of go through some of what we've been through because i don't think we're alone in this i think there are people all over the world who are trying to uh, sort of unpick this what seems to be an insoluble um question and in some ways it is it is insoluble um and i'll just start with some of the basics the basic is that you've got the advanced countries so-called advanced countries the more developed countries and then you've got the so-called less developed countries and part of the problem is <clears throat> is that living in the the less developed countries is freer and cheaper as anybody who's lived in one knows compared to living in the so-called free west well freer and cheaper as long as you don't you know let's say you're in thailand you don't go around criticizing the royal family i mean there'll, there'll be things you can't touch there'll be things you should keep your mouth shut about um but outside of those things generally you're going to find things a, a lot easier however anyone who's lived in those sorts of places is going to find that those countries too are all sort of shuffling along the same conveyor belt the agenda is one it doesn't really matter where you go all you can really achieve is going back in time slightly but the the general tendency is all towards the same stuff more control more bureaucracy a single educational system a single uh, pharmaceutical system uh, genetically modified food obviously you've got chem trading and all this stuff um and oh and mass homosexualization and indoctrination of your children the whole thing so of course if you are awake and living in the us or the uk or anywhere in europe you can see that obviously but if you go and spend a few months in you know third world country x it can it can potentially seem like things are a lot easier but at the same time you don't speak the language you don't have probably um you know the documentation to live there permanently you don't have friendships you don't have all of that so you, and you will be seen as a foreigner so you're a target i mean to some extent anyway you you may people may smile at you etc cetera, etc cetera, but your lunch um in a in a different way to the way that your lunch you know in, in your home country so you know i've heard americans who uh, there was one guy i listened to he'd moved to some central american country he'd sold up in 
you know, where, wherever it was, and taken his money. And suddenly he was very wealthy and living in, I can't remember where it was. I think it may have been Ecuador or one of those one of those countries. And he was he was complaining about what had happened to him, that the local police chief had come round and sort of had been hanging out f- for a bribe, you see. And he had taken his American mentality with him and, you know, I'm going to stand on principle. And he refused to to deal with this guy. And he lost everything. He lost everything. And he, you know, he, he'd sold everything to go there. And he was gone back to America now with nothing. I mean, listening to this chap talk, it was absolutely clear to me instantaneously that it wasn't really a bribe. What the guy wanted, what the police guy wanted, was he wanted... He wanted... A friendly response. If you'd just given him a cup of tea or, you know, some lunch and just treated him a little bit more humanly, he wouldn't have had all of these problems. In in, I think I could see that he just absolutely. I could because I've lived in countries like this that he had no idea what he was dealing with. So, you know, it's a bit of a double bind. On the one hand, it's true if you go and live in cheap countries, etc. Yeah, a lot of things are cheaper, but you are going to come up against all of this, you know, stuff. And you better be ready for it, because that's how the world works there still. And you're not going to be able to cross the road without getting nearly killed every time. You know what I mean? So it's it. I think there are a lot of people who are traveling around trying to find the magic m- medium, you know, the, where, where it's cheap like the yeast or the undeveloped countries and civilized like the west but without all of the all the stuff you don't like let me tell you that place doesn't exist okay it doesn't exist it'll just save you a lot of money a lot of heartache a lot of time it doesn't exist forget about it okay <laughs> just forget about it. it doesn't exist this world is being turned into uh, i mean it's a it's a kind of closet tyranny at the moment and it's being turned into an open tyranny and it's been done by degrees and everywhere is on the same on the same conveyor belt by the time you can cross the street safely and by the time you get the things that you like when you lived in the west in this new country it's got all of the rest of the other stuff you left the west to get away from and if there is some sort of magic almost sweet spot it'll only last for a couple of years what i'm trying to say is you can't run away from what's happening there is no escape except in communication of God and his messages according to the Quran and that's what we've found that serving God that's the only way out you're going to die anyway and there is no you know even if you were able to find the perfect place for you and your children you know there's still uh, cancer and radiation and you know, or, you know so I'm just trying to say is, trying to find the perfect environment i mean obviously it's natural within people we all want to improve our lots it's it's natural but there isn't anywhere to run to in my opinion i'm sure i'm going to get lots of people in the comments below saying i live in you know country x and it's wonderful here good i'm glad it is for you and it it may be right for you and that's great but my bet is that pretty soon it's going to You know, if things are quote unquote improving, they're going to. It's a bit like, um, it's a bit like iTunes. You see, things improve to such an extent that they they become unusable, and in fact, a form of tyranny where you can't access anything that you used to be able to have. It's just cheese in the mousetrap, and once they've got you nibbling at the cheese, then they can lock you down, and that's just how it works. It works in the internet. We all know this, and that's how it works administratively across the world. Now, I haven't lived in every country, but I have traveled to, I can't remember, but a lot of countries. And I'm just going to give you something of our experience. Now, this is not definitive. It's not advice. It's just for you to kind of compare your own experience against and hopefully, you know, give you some some help, I hope, because I do get this sort of thing, especially, you know, families with children and so on. Now, I'm... You know, you can hear I'm I'm British English, okay? So my I was born in in the UK, in England. I have British citizenship, and I'll, I'll get into why this is relevant in a minute. I also happen to have Russian citizenship, and I happen to speak Russian fluently. So that's 
and, and I'm starting with this because this is important because when you're living abroad, when you're trying to survive in this, you know, in this deteriorating um, sort of village, world village now, which is becoming, you know, balkanized, balkanized and homogenized at the same time, your documents count for a lot. Um, so that's what I have. Our daughter has both citizenships as well. My wife has only Russian citizenship. Now, that make, made a difference. Now, the countries we've lived in, I mean, really lived, I'm not talking about visited, I'm talking about lived, lived, paid, you know, gas bills, electricity bills, you know, survived in for over a year, include, or are, are to date, are Russia, Spain, the United Kingdom, and Georgia. This is for Americans, not the state of Georgia, but the country of Georgia and the Caucasus. So those are the places that we've lived. So our sort of hope was that we would find somewhere that it would be possible to start a community of Quran believers, Quran alone believers. My opinion after what I've learned over the last four or five years is that I don't believe that's possible. I mean, if you managed to do it, fantastic. But I, I don't think that beyond a sort of um, a club of... Uh, uh, sort of enthusiasts, you know, like train spotters. I, I don't think that it's going to be possible purely because this section of humanity is a, a very sort of, it's a very thin and narrow um, demographic. So you've got people, you know, you'll have very few in Pakistan, a very few in you know, America, very few in Britain, wherever. So we're we're spread all over the world, right across the world, you see. So purely in terms of documentation, finding somewhere where people from all those places could go and live without being, you know, hassled by the police all the time and then extradited or kicked out of the country. I thought that Georgia was possibly that place, and I really looked. But but Georgia's changing too now, and their um, not their visa requirements, their sh the short term visa requirements, but their uh, citizenship requirements have, uh, are changing. So that I don't believe it's possible, um, unless you know the sheikh of somewhere you know oil rich decided to 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 sponsor this. Uh, I don't think it's possible. So that's just what I've I've come to. So what you're left with is that the um, trying to find like-minded people in your own locale, country, time zone, all of that stuff. And that's why I started meetquaranites.com. And that's really why I made it uh, almost like a cul-de-sac. You can't really go in and just chat and, you know, it's not another talking shop. The, the only thing you can really do there is say hi to people and then exchange emails and then phone numbers and, and then, you know, start a life. It's not a place for people wanting to set up their own little, you know, ideological fiefdoms and people who try to do that get closed down really quickly. Uh, I've got a, there's a brother who is the admin then, and that's, that's his remit. That's his, that's what I've asked him to do. So quite a lot of people don't really understand what it's for. It, it's not a forum. It's not another, you know, anonymous place where you can talk, and talk and talk it's some way if you it's for real people who really want to talk to somebody and get to know them and meet for coffee or you know meet in the real world so that's really all you can do there so, so that's why i set that up bureaucracy is is closing in absolutely everywhere in case you haven't noticed now it's more obvious to people who live in america i think people live in in europe and so on but this is happening everywhere and again i feel that i at quite an advantage living in these various countries because you can see the same agenda. Let's take what's euphemistically called the sexual revolution. Now, this happened, the same event happened in all the countries that I've lived in, but at different times. So let's take the United Kingdom. The sexual revolution of you know, degeneracy and sort of a kind of de destructive liberalism began i would say at the very end of the 1960s the early 70s that's when it it began late 60s in spain i realized when, when we lived in spain there was this huge uh, uh, oh yeah going back to the united kingdom there was a difference between my mother's generation who and, and you know, my parents generation that whole generation who were 
who who were caught in the wave of this and they're degraded and you know ignorant and have no interest in the main i mean these are huge generalizations but they're you know they're degraded and you can see it and they compare them with their parents who still have honor and decency and don't swear and i'm not talking about these are generalizations but you could see a marked difference between this cutoff point those born before the war and and those born after it just this just this dividing line the beatles generation basically were were indoctrinated and they became the ideological uh, fodder for the degeneracy, degeneracy which is happening now so this is cut off line and it happened at this particular time when we lived in spain i noticed that it had happened there 10 years later because spain was kept pretty strict until about 10 years later and then the same thing there degeneracy um, obviously i'm talking about the whole country but my, my impression of spain the, the sexual profligacy it's just it's just endemic and we lived all over Spain. Uh, we lived in um, um, Valencia, which is uh, sort of like above Alicante, a place called Gandia. Uh, we lived there for you know, several months and we lived in uh, Galicia, which is a uh, very different terrain and um, in, the, in, the, in the north, more Celtic. And we lived in, uh, we lived in Salamanca. Um, which is, um, you know, classical Spanish, um, the centre of Spain. Because I realised that Spain was actually an empire. It, 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 I, I'd thought it was a country, but it's an empire, um, you know, starting from the centre. And we lived also uh, down the south in Andalusia. We lived very cheaply. We rented, pla- and I was doing this project all the time. We're trying to find somewhere that that, that worked. But uh, you, I could see that this is a country, and uh, please, if you're Spanish and you know intelligent and, and wonderful and everything, please, I'm, I'm not criticizing you personally. I'm just saying that I felt the place was, you know, it didn't really feel like it had any future, either morally or in any other way. Um, I mean, beautiful country. I've driven all over Spain. It's a, it's a, it's a phenomenally beautiful country. But it just seemed that all the and this this is what you happen happens to all the intelligent people or a lot of the intelligent people tend to leave so that that was what was going on there in in, in georgia it, they had like i think this sort of this sexual revolution thing had a sort of false start um i would say at the late 90s early 2000s perhaps perhaps into the 2000s somewhere with the generation of um oh crikey what's his name whoever the uh he's he was or is the governor of Odessa now and I've, i'm blanking on his name it'll come to me in a minute but when he he actually did some very good changes in terms of administrative changes um but georgia that generation of youth became very selfish and very you know the me generation and then it sort of stopped and Georgia went. It was was frozen in time for a, a bit, and now it started again. You can spot it: you, the, the green hair, the Dr. Martin boots. You know, the women with the attitude. And all. You can see they're being they're being programmed. You can see them being programmed. It's you know, but but this thing happens at different times. In Russia, um, the same, absolutely the same process, absolutely the same process, the same agenda. Eastern religions, vegetarianism, lesbianism, um, the whole thing, just you know, sexual revolution, i.e., you know, profligacy and lack of morality, all of that. Um, that kicked in straight after Glasnost, Perestroika, all of this stuff. So it would have been the early, late 80s, but really early 90s, that when that kicked in. And then that generation, in some ways, in some ways, is easier to get on with because it's you know it's they're more entrepreneurial they, they they want things they're not like soviet mentality just sitting there doing nothing and waiting to feel your pension but on the other hand you know you've got all of the other stuff as well so i'm not here to say it's good or bad i'm just saying that everywhere is uh, we're ruled we are ruled there is an agenda you can train people to do pretty much anything so if you're looking for a perfect country it doesn't exist 
you kind of have to <laughs> make peace with that. That's what I'm trying to trying to say. My view is that the the ruling elite and the way that I see the world, I don't see any difference between the East and the West. I'm not some sort of pro-Putin, pro-Russia. We we live, we've come back to Russia. I'll get into why perhaps a bit later on, but it's not that I'm sort of you know very gung ho about that or claim that Russia is this perfect place. I don't see that at all. In my view, what they're doing is they're bringing the West down and they're using mass immigration, uh, the, the destruction of the, the cultural um, underpinnings of the, of Europe, and they're using the propagation of mm, homosexualization. And it's, it's, it's borderline grooming already of, of school children by the state now in order to de- make that entire sort of population degenerate. I mean... I watched, spoke to children of somebody that I'm close to when we were in England, and I just quizzed them on some things that they, some general knowledge, they knew nothing. They, Their ignorance was shocking to me and actually to their own mother, who assumed they were getting an education. They, What you have is a, a, a sort of, um, they're pushing um, mediocrity and pseudo knowledge they don't really know anything and they certainly can't do anything with what they know and what they're being they're being trained uh, into an ideological mindset the schooling is just is now purely it's social engineering and nothing more i think it's always been social engineering to a certain extent but there used to be an education of some kind now that's gone it's just social engineering so i'm going to get into whether it's worth going to school and all that in a minute so the cost of living in the west is is frighteningly high and everything, and it's not just in the West, this is happening, you know, wherever there is so-called progress. And everything now is fake. Um, fake friends, fake ownership. Um, everything, if you want to buy anything real, it costs two or three times what you, th- what you think it costs. You see, because what we're having, what we're having is a, a controlled collapse of, of the currencies across the world. They're all highly inflationary through what's called quantitative easing, easing, because the, the the system is in meltdown. It was designed to be. Bretton Woods was designed to fail. It was, you know, failure was, was baked into the cake because they knew where they wanted to go after that. But they have to hide it from us. So the way they hide it from us is what they, we, you can still buy a washing machine, you can still buy, you know, a cassette record, all these things, but it'll break in three weeks, you know, maybe three weeks, as soon as the, the guarantee is gone. And, people are now being trained that that's how it works so if you want a good one if you want one that really works it'll cost you you know an order of magnitude more than one that will you know a washing machine that will just be hopping around your bath you know wherever you keep your washing machine hopping around the kitchen when it's on spin so the 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 cost of real food i.e non genetically modified food that isn't going to kill you is astronomical if you're going to buy real food real water real stuff now obviously the elite they're buying you know they're getting real stuff but they know what the actual cost of living is that's being hidden from us so everything is designed to break everything is you know we we, we're given this sort of plastic illusion where, where what we're doing is fundamentally living in a in a, in a in a plastic prison and because it looks free and the vocabulary the nomenclature is you know talks about freedom and so on people think they are free and if you if you can see that you're not then you know it's quite difficult to to do to stay there but okay so what to do i mean especially if you if you're still listening to this and you understand you know what i'm talking about and you believe in god in the last day and you want to do, and you do good works um, and especially if you have family, if you have children, what what can you do? Um, it's certainly easy to become disheartened, and I, you know I've certainly been there myself. Now, if you know my work, you you know that the sort of core um, thesis of my work is that the Quran, its model is warning the elite after which the the punishments of God become binding. That's the the Quranic formula. 
Um, I don't believe in the Islamic religion. I think it's another form of mind control. It's certainly, you can't point to it in the Quran. Um, so, in a way, this compounds what I'm talking about. Um, so, the, for us, the implication is that this could be the end. So, all of those things, I'm just throwing them into a big pot. And now I'm going to try to give you some, unpick them and share some of the thoughts that, that we've come to, some of the conclusions we, we're at. Firstly, and first and foremost, if we're talking about a sort of um, a final time of the end, the Quran is very clear. I'm not talking about what m Muslim scholars claim. I'm not talking about eschatological narratives derived from other sources. I'm talking about what the Quran says. The Quran says that only God knows when it's going to come. Okay? You don't know and I don't know. And the Christian's narrative, the Quran does not confirm that. The Jewish narrative, frankly, as, as is the Christian narrative, especially with the Messianic, uh, what they mean by Messianic, all derives from Talmud. All derives from Talmud. You can't really point to anything in, in the Tanakh as it is in its present state and say, you know, this is Messianic in the sense that modern Jews mean it. If, if it were not anticipated from the Talmud, so it works that way around. And the Christian anticipations are second generation derived from the same source fundamentally. The traditionalist Muslim has quite a lot of syncretic stuff derived from the same source as well, plus he's thrown in another load of his own, which comes from wherever it comes from, you know, pagan, Arab, made up, who knows, um, you know. Um, from the Persians, who knows, but it, who knows, I don't, and nor apparently do they, they claim that it's, you know, that the Prophet Muhammad gave them this, well, the Quran says something very different, it, it, it denies Muhammad any insights into these things, and the Quranic position is that we don't know. What we do see, though, however, is that the, the Sunnah of God, the word Sunnah occurs 16 times in the Quran, and in no case does it ever refer to either the Prophet Muhammad or any other Prophet. But it, it does talk about the, the Sunnah, the practice of God, and it says that it doesn't change. And the Sunnah of God in the Qur'an is that there is a warning of the, the elite, the rulers, after which, generally speaking, they, they reject, and then the punishments of God become binding. Now, in that context, um, homeschooling starts to look somewhat you know, opaque, <laughs> if that's truly the case however my own view is is that we should invest our in ourselves uh, and our children why because you know we've we're guaranteed a, a thousand years ten thousand years on this earth no why because it's the right thing to do it's and you know it is it doesn't make any difference. I mean, leaving leaving uh, apocalyptic visions to one side. Um, I mean, you know, e even the even the atheistic environmentalists and so on, they have a, a kind of analogous point of view where, for them, it's the environment and blah blah blah. They have a whole you know eschatology, and so they're wrestling with some of the same questions themselves. Except they, they don't have God. They must be really horrendous. So, for me, it's a matter of doing the right thing each day, and, and fearing God each day, and doing that right thing. It's not about you know, whether you're going to it's you're going to get the result that you wish for. It's about planting the right seeds and letting God. You know, I'm sort of paraphrasing the Apostle Paul here, but <laughs> letting God, you know, take care of the increase. That's the way that I see it. I certainly don't recommend, either on the basis of my own experience or on the basis of my understanding of the Qur'an or my understanding of life, that we should in any way become like the Jehovah's Witnesses who have no education. Well, it's not quite true. The Jehovah's Witnesses have got a, have got um, almost like a caste system where the, the upper echelons, they all, they all invest in the future. They've got real estate. They've got, you know, and the poor drones out there doing the, 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 the donkey work, they've got no education. And 
and and no in, in, no no you know no no wealth nothing uh, and no opportunities and they actually paint themselves into a corner whereby they can't do anything else but what it is they're doing so <clears throat> do i recommend that no absolutely not and i think you'd be very foolish to put you know to leave yourself with no means of of obtaining your bread in this life apart from anything else it's a good thing to be able to add value to give value real value in what in what you do and we all know that because we feel good when we do it now what about education well i can tell you for myself i don't you, you may be surprised to hear this but i don't force the quran down my child's throat you know she's we're not i don't get up at three o'clock in the morning to um, make her recite uh, al-fatiha or anything like that no i don't do any of that uh to be perfectly honest i mean she's five and a half you, you can't really understand it when you're five and a half anyway so what's the point um i'm not going to make her um, repeat in arabic words she doesn't understand I'm, I'm not going to do that it seems to me pointless the way i see it it's not that um it, the way I see it, it's the life lived rather than the, you know, the words preached. And she sees us. She sees how we live. She sees us reading. She sees us praying. She sees us working for God. So that is woven into the, the waft and web of our lives. So that is how I see it. I, I don't believe in forcing. I mean, obviously, the question of God comes into a conversation a five-year-old will give you their questions this is the way i see it now you may disagree and you're very welcome to you may think that that you know when you're very young it's it, it's a good use of time to memorize whole tracts of the quran i don't know you may be you're correct but i don't personally practice that i don't see it as being productive i know people who have memorized huge portions of the quran and you know, I haven't been that impressed with with their life. So, children will tell you, and it doesn't mean that I'm not going to teach my daughter what I've learned or teach her the, the Quran. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that I'm in the same way as I wouldn't try to you know teach her the um, you know difficult concepts in certain areas now i leave those things for a later time but they'll present you with their questions when when they're ready and if you notice the way children are they'll just you know they'll, they'll be you'll be doing one thing i don't know i'm playing a you know banging a drum or you know coloring in a picture and then they'll turn to you and say daddy you know who's god so they'll uh, the children jump around you know they're in in their questions and you kind of got to be ready, ready for that so I do, I do now go to the Quran and open and maybe give her a verse and read it to her, and then we'll talk about it and just put it away. I, what I don't do though is 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 bang on about it because I don't see there's any point. Children come to you with their questions, and and I I, I personally feel that that's the best way of doing it. Um, do we do put a lot into our education, and for us i i i do teach her how to read i um and maths english reading writing all of this stuff um and it is becoming it is regular well it, we've just moved country so it's got a bit gone a bit by the by but it it is generally a regular practice with us and if you just spend an hour a day teaching a child um you, know, you can achieve an awful lot and I, I do think the parents are often well qualified to teach children the things that they are good at and this is how people always used to learn this outsourcing of all education to these places where people go for eight hours a day i don't personally like it i don't like schools i don't like what they've become i also think they're a, an inane waste of time in in the main that's my own personal opinion you may disagree and if you've got a wonderful school great but but this is where we are with it anyway she's five and a half in in russian system you don't have to go to school till you're eight i think eight's the latest that you can leave it languages obviously we lived in countries where 
different languages were spoken and I did put her into into nurseries so she speaks fluent English now I mean obviously I'm English but it was an English nursery that where she got that other children spoke this language and then she started to speak English because before that she just spoke Russian and now she speaks English great and when we lived in Georgia I put her straight into a Georgian nursery and she speaks fluent Georgian so she speaks three languages I don't I, well, I actually speak four or five words of Georgian, but she's blah 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 blah. You know, she really speaks it. And I said to the to the women who work there because they all speak, you know, Russian to some degree, usually not very good. I said, please don't talk to my daughter in Russian. They said yes, but she doesn't understand something. I said, I don't, it doesn't matter. She'll get it. I was very emphatic with on that point, and and they bless them. They they stuck to it. Six months later, they said she speaks just like all the other children. She's got no accent. She's so that sort of thing. I just think is very useful. Now that would be different depending on where you are. If you've got if you've got you know your your father has a farm and you know you put your child on the farm. Children like to be in the environment and just doing stuff and doing stuff with other children doing stuff with older children doing stuff you know they want to do stuff this segmentation of education is is i personally am not a big fan of it and we have up to now opted out of school and we may continue to do so so what we're doing instead is we've moved to a city where there are a lot of opportunities for very cheap relative to the west things like dancing violin piano all this stuff and we, she's going to classes where that's what they do. So she, I mean, she goes ice skating, gymnastics, painting. This she's just got this whole itinerary of stuff, and it costs compared to the West peanuts. And she loves going to those classes, and also she's getting the English and the maths and, and obviously Russian and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. What else? What could school really give her apart from? A really bad attitudes and access to pornography on on children's mobile devices i can't see it that's the way i see it now i'm not telling you what you should do i'm just i've been asked what i do and what my thoughts are on on it and i'm just sort of sharing those things so kind of i'm going to start sort of drawing toward the ends of this rather long and long piece now you do have to work out where you can live and survive in terms of languages and documentation there's no way around that now. You know, this idea, especially people from an Islamic background have got of hijrah and going off and living in a blah, blah, blah country. There's the, the, the world is locked down, in case you haven't noticed. You can't just go from one place to another place. And it is a prison, and the prison you're in is actually a tax farm. That's how it works. That's what citizenship is. It's You have the right and the obligation to support your own prison that's how it works okay you can't just leave that prison go off the plantation and go and live somewhere else because they'll they'll bring you back okay screaming and hollering that's how it works it is a prison it may not sound like one it may not look like one things are ergonomic and shiny and you've got good sewage or you know depending on where you live but fundamentally you're there to support the machine and if you don't have the documentations and if you don't have the language, I mean, you get people, I saw them in Spain, people, uh, Brits, British people who had sold up. They'd been to Spain on holiday, had a wonderful time, thought it was all amazing and thought, ah, oh, we can sell our our house in Walton on Thames for, you know, X amount. And we can move to Spain, buy a much better house and have tons of money left over and you know, wonderful weather and so on. And yeah problem is that they don't speak the language and they don't get the culture and then often unless they're very fortunate they don't they end up they can end up very secluded and very lonely in a, a place they don't understand and doesn't understand them and they don't really speak the language language counts for an awful lot it's why we moved one of the main reasons we moved back to russia because living in spain and then living in georgia yeah, I mean, I, I speak enough Spanish to get by, but Georgian, I wasn't going to learn it. I, I wasn't going to learn it because I couldn't see the point for me, personally. Nobody else speaks it. I mean, there are three million Georgian speakers in the world. I'm not going to put that time investment. If it had been 
you know, Mandarin or something. Yeah, sure, but not for Jordan. I wasn't going to make that kind of investment. So I got by. In fact, I more than got by. I could speak Russian. And so I spoke Russian with anybody over 35 and I could broken English with anybody under 35. So I could survive. But you want to know what's going on, all the bureaucracies in Georgian. So, you know, you have to deal with it. That's, you know, it, it, it's just reality. Um, more importantly, live for God. And this is the top thing. You know, don't wait until you retire to start living. I know people, I know people whom I respect. They're intelligent. A, a particular guy in mind. I know that he, I know that he, he he loves God and he wants to do something for God, but he's he's put it off for his children. He's got to see them through university and his parents, you know, until they're dead and this and that and this and that and this and that. My experience has been is when you do put God first, he gives you this stuff back. You know, he'll he'll make a way. But don't think that this is the easy way out because it definitely isn't. Um, you, you know, it, it, it definitely isn't. We haven't taken a mortgage. This is something, and I'm not criticizing people who have mortgages. You've got to make your own decisions. But I did consider, and in fact, I approached somebody whom I had a, a good feeling about, somebody who supports my work and was was very stable and you know not um unpredictable and i approached i approached her and her and th through her her husband and asked them if they would lend us a, a small amount relatively very small amount to buy a, s a small cheap flat in an in a cheap area a cheap country in fact russia but cheap um with no interest and they very kindly agreed. However, when push came to shove, um, I'd, I backed out and I and I thanked them very much for it. But I, the reason why I did is because I, I mean, my instinct was we've got to have something. Also, you know, I want to provide for my, if something <laughs> in this line of work, do you know what I mean? You have to be aware of, of, of what can potentially happen. And I, I have a wife and child. I want to. I want to provide. Um, but I. I did back away from it, and I thanked them very much for their kindness and in considering my my approach. But I decided that debt would. Um, it would. In some way, weaken my ability to say what exactly what I think and to do this work. So that was our decision, but it may not be the right one for you, you see. Now, we now live in Russia. We've moved back to Russia for many reasons. One is that my wife's documentation here is now no longer a problem. Secondly, we all speak the language, so that's not a problem. Thirdly, we know how it all works here. Um, but also, you can still get good education in some areas. I'm not here trying to convince people to move for, to Russia, God forbid. I'm just saying that for us, this was the right decision. Also, Russians, uh, there are a lot of bad things about Russia and Russians, but there are some very good things as well. And Russians are still reasonably normal. I mean, the, the same agendas going along here is going on everywhere else. But if I ever tell them what I witnessed and what's going on now in the West in terms of this promotion of this homosexualization agenda they're they're appalled so they're, they're not brainwashed in the same way as westerners are uh, yet i'm sure it'll, i'm sure it'll come also russia has in the five years where we were away well russia, russia has i was very surprised it's really changed and it's really changed well from what i've seen for the better for example, you can now cross the road without getting killed. Um, they've really clamped down on that. The driving has got way better. I mean, I, well, I'm talking about the main centers that I've been in, Moscow and a couple of other cities. No comparison to how it was before. The bureaucratic side of life here, uh, and I, I'm not working for the Russian Tourist Board by any means, has improved beyond recognition beyond recognition it's way better than britain 
way better. They've now got kind of joined up government as opposed to this other thing. Um, it's just, there's no comparison to how easy, how you know, it's so easy now compared to how it was. And especially for us coming back, you know, after living in these even tougher countries, Russia seems, well, the places where we are, it seems much, 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 much easier. So, um, but I'm not a Russophile. I'm not one of these people who thinks Putin's fighting the new world order. I don't believe that for a second. And if you do, I, I suggest you, you know, you, you, you're being quite naive. Uh, I mean, just to put things in perspective for you, they built a, a Holocaust museum at uh, Paklona Gara, which is this big park in near, uh, in the centre of Moscow, Park Pabiedek. Um, they've got they've got a synagogue, they've got a, a mosque, and they've got a church, and they've got a Holocaust museum. So they've got memorials to four religions on this piece of territory. Doubting the Holocaust is an imprisonable offence here. You can go to prison for it, okay, in this country. The ruble is joined at the hip to the dollar, and the Russian legal system was given to it by US aid. So that should tell you everything you really need to know. You know I'm sure there are, there is real conflict, you know, the, the lower down the tree, but at the top, at the pinnacle, at the apex of this thing, it's just one thing. So for us, we're staying focused on our main mission. And our main mission is this project. It's warning the elite. It's you know, communicating the messages of God. It's, it's doing what we're doing. There is, no, there is no other safety. There is no way out of this. We are all going to the day of judgment. None of these things are changed by the, the, the local situation that we're in. The time that we live in, we we have some advantages. We can communicate using this system for now, um, but ultimately, the the big questions of life and death and our purpose here and and all of this is the same now as it was for anybody who's ever been alive. The logistics are different, but the 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 facts are not. I'm going to close with a with a verse, which the a couple of verses, the the key point uh, of which is is well, not one of the key points of which is not immediately evident, but I'll, I'll it's twenty eight sort of twenty eight verses twenty nine and thirty. Now, the scenario is that Musa has been in Madian. He's been in this region of Madian and he's got married and he has agreed with his father-in-law to be a certain period of time to to work and he marries his daughter etc so then we, we continue then when musa had completed the term and was traveling with his family he perceived from the side of the mount a fire he said to his family wait here i perceive a fire Perhaps I can bring you intelligence or a firebrand from the fire that you might warm yourselves. Then when he came to it, he was called from the right side of the valley on hallowed ground from the tree. O Musa, I am God, the Lord of all mankind. Now that's 28 to 29 through 30. A salient point here, and one which is easily missed, is that Musa was travelling with his family. He's got his wife, probably a couple of children. What it doesn't say is you need to go and live somewhere really safe and just stay there until your children are grown up. No, none of that. When Musa went into the, into, into Misr, into the land of Firaun, he went with his wife and his child whatever education they got they got on the way he did his task we've become very um we've become very domesticated and we 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 we're trained that we can't um you know find a new way out that everything's got to there's got to be you know this sort of prepackaged way of doing things children are incredibly resilient and the worst thing you can do is bore them. 
And I think that if well, my experience is, is that if you if you serve God actively, and I don't just mean you know blah blah blah, I mean really put your life into it. They'll they'll pick up on that. Grown up children too. And they'll respect you, and they'll you know they'll sense your sincerity. But if you spend your life in frustration and in in um, in opposition, opposition to your true mission, your salat, your duty. I don't believe that you're really setting the kind of example that that is required of a parent. I can't give you specifics because I don't believe it's my job. But what I can do is share with you my experience and some principles and leave it, I hope, to make... Um, you know, in f better, you know, the best decisions that are right for you. So I hope that helps, and that's all for now. If you're listening on YouTube, you can download my full translation of the Quran free using the button in the top right-hand corner, or buy the hard copy there at 10% less than on Amazon. I also encourage you to sign up for the Quranite Plus newsletter on the site to get occasional micro-updates. You can download the audio from my YouTube videos to your mobile device using the links in the drop down below. I recommend meetquranites.com to connect with other Quran alone believers. Like if you like, comment if you have something constructive to say and subscribe to get more each week. And use the link in the drop down below to donate if you would like to help me keep doing this. And remember, this life is short. Eternity is long. If you want good trees, plant good seeds.